All right, so in, in, in Proverbs chapter 4 here, there's a long section of Proverbs 4 that we read that's talking about wisdom and all the great benefits that you receive from having wisdom and knowledge and instruction. It says in verse number 5, this is, you know, um, the, the verse number one starts off, Hear ye children the instruction of a father. So he's trying to give them good advice. Right? Listen to my words. I'm instructing you. Verse number five, Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Over and over again through the book of Proverbs, you're going to hear this. It's, it's, a, it's written in a way of like a father to a son in many of the books of the Proverbs. And he keeps on repeating himself over and over again. Hear my instruction. Listen to my words. I'm trying to teach you something. Pay attention. Listen close. You need to get wisdom. You need to get smart. You need to understand these great words. He says wisdom is a principal thing. It's, a, it's, it's an important, the most important thing. Get this wisdom. Don't forget it. Don't, don't let this slip out of your mind. Don't decline from the words of my mouth. He says, if you, he says, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. She, your wisdom and knowledge is going to keep you going. It's going to keep you in the right path. So we need to stay focused on wisdom. Receiving instruction and gaining knowledge has to come first. But I'm not preaching on this tonight. This is the first. He says, wisdom is the principal thing. But what I'm preaching on tonight is what you do with that wisdom after you receive it. What do you do with the knowledge? The knowledge that you receive from the Bible, what are you doing with it? A lot of people will go to church and hear messages and they'll, and they'll read their Bibles at home. Because you want to learn. And learning's important. Hey, wisdom's a principal thing. It's great to have a knowledge of God and His Word and what it means. It's another thing to put it into action. They're two different things. You have to start with the wisdom. If you don't have the wisdom, you don't even know what to act on. You don't even know what to do. We have to start by getting in this book and reading it and gaining the wisdom and knowledge, understanding it, but don't let it stop there. Too many Christians, I think, let it stop at that point of just learning. A lot of people dedicate their whole life just to learning and spend almost no time doing we need to have a good balance of both. We need to continually learn. Because look, you're never going to get to the point to where you just know everything. So we're constantly needing to increase our wisdom and increase our knowledge. That's why you ought to be reading the Bible every day of your life. Because you're never going to just know everything. I mean, I've either listened to or read the Bible probably over 30. I, I, don't, I don't count. I, don't, you know, I, I lose count. I make it a mandatory minimum. I read the Bible once a year with my family. That's not my own personal Bible reading. That's not my preparation for sermons. It's not my listening to the Bible on audio when I drive to and from work either. So if I were to count all of the time, you know, how many times I've gone through the Bible, I mean, it's, it's probably at least around 30 or over 30 times of just going through the Bible over and over and over again. In the New Testament, even more. And I'm not saying it's above my soul. I'm just saying, like, you could read it that many times and still just, I mean, there's an incredible amount still to learn. I feel like I know so little in the vast knowledge that the Bible contains. We need to continually be striving after getting knowledge from the Bible. But don't, and, and the reason why I'm saying all this is don't wait until you feel like you have all this knowledge before you start doing things. We need to incorporate the doing part immediately. Turn, if you would, to um, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 in the New Testament. I'm going to read for you from Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy 5, where God's given the, the, the nation of Israel his Old Testament laws. It says in verse number 1, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day. Moses is preaching God's commandments, his statutes, his judgments. He's letting them all know of what the laws are, what God's laws, what the commandments are, what God expects them to do, the instruction for them and how they need to live their lives and, and what they need to do and what they need to not do and all these things for their life. He's giving them the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your ears this day. He says that ye may learn them and keep and do them. 
It's not enough just to learn them. It's not enough just to read and get this head knowledge and know, okay, well, that, yep, that's what the Bible says. No, we need to put them into action and do them. Very famous verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. God wants you studying His Word, His Bible. He wants you to know His words so that we can show ourselves approved by Him. In God's eyes, you can be approved by God by studying His Word. But look at, look at the next phrase. It says, A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We need to study because God's saying you are a workman. You are someone who's to do work. That's why you're a workman. I mean, God doesn't just give us this knowledge to sit around and do nothing. It's like having the knowledge of salvation. Hey, if you're saved, you're born again, you receive that free gift from God, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You're going to heaven when you die because Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins. And that is awesome. But now that you have that knowledge... And you know that your faith has saved you. You know that that salvation comes as a free gift. What are you doing with that knowledge? Does anybody else know? Do you have friends and family, neighbors, other people? Do they have that same knowledge? And if they don't, why don't you share that with them? That is the number, that is the number one thing. And that's why I'm hitting it first. Because this is the lifeblood of this church. And I know we're a small church right now, but we're going to grow. We're going to reach people. They go, we were out for hours today, and there's a lot of people that don't want to hear it. I get that. But you know what? There's also a lot of people that do want to hear it. And those are the ones that we're concerned with, the ones that actually want to hear God's Word. They want to know the knowledge of, uh, that God has and the, the message of salvation. But we are the workmen. You already have that knowledge. You are that workman that needs to be able to, first of all, it says, it says that needs not to be ashamed. The way you're ashamed is when you don't know anything about the Bible, right? If God wants to use you to do some work, to do some work for Him, He expects you to have some knowledge. And if you don't have that knowledge, you're going to be ashamed. This says rightly dividing the word of truth. When you don't know, you know, a lot of people, and you know, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with being a babe in Christ. There's nothing wrong if you just got saved recently. Hey, you're not expected to know all this stuff. You're not expected to know, you know, vast majority of the, of, of the Bible and, and doctrine and everything else because as a babe in Christ, you need to grow and learn. But we all ought to be um, desiring, the Bible says, as babes desire the sincere milk of the word. That's a command. It's not saying that babies do want the milk of the Word. He's saying we should desire the milk of the Word as a newborn babe in Christ. If when, you, when you get saved, you ought to want to hear and learn and do more. That is something that we need to, if you don't have that desire, you need to instill in yourself that desire to want to do more and to want to serve more and want to learn more. And the more you learn, then you won't be ashamed. You'll be able to do the work that God has set out for you without being ashamed. He says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So we need to, to be able to study God's word to be a good workman. But to shun, I mean shut out the profane and vain babblings. You know, these people that just, oh, there is no God, and, uh, you know, and go on and on about all these reasons why they think there is no God. They're, those are vain. Those are babblings. It's not anything we need to waste our time with that. Just get it out of your life. It says they're going to increase unto more ungodliness. The only thing that's going to do by listening to that is just going to increase ungodliness in your life. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter number 3. You're in 2 Timothy 2. Just flip over a page to the right. The next book of the Bible is Titus. Titus chapter 3. Because you see, we, when, we, when we get wisdom and we get this understanding and we, we read the Bible, it's not so that we can show everybody how smart we are. That's not the point. The point is to say, oh, well, the Bible says this here. So you can show everyone that you are just so smart and you're just so intelligent. I just know the Bible so well. There's a lot of people, not a lot, there's, there's people that come into you from time to time that want to, that just, they just love to debate, they love to argue, and they just want to show you how smart they are. 
That's not why we do this at all. We're not, to, we're not learning God's Word to just get into a debates and try to win an argument against somebody. That's not the point. Right? You can win an argument, but that does nothing for that person. If you're going to win an argument, hopefully it'll be done in a way so that you can help them to convert, to understand where their error is if, you know, in their doctrine, and, and you can teach them. But as I, I went a whole sermon this morning about being humble when you go through and lead somebody to Christ. And this is the same attitude, this is the attitude that we need to have. As you learn the Bible, don't let yourself get puffed up. We need to learn the, the Bible so that we can be more effective in showing people because, you, you know, it's truth, it's wisdom. It's good stuff to have. But the point isn't just to lift yourself up and just say, oh yeah, look how smart I am. That has nothing to do with it. Titus 3, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. So again, the same admonition that we just saw in, in 2 Timothy to shun profane in vain babblings. You know, there's people out there that are going to want to fight with you about God's law. They're going to want to fight with you about, you know, these genealogies and, and these foolish questions. Don't get wrapped up into it. It's unprofitable and vain. Vain means meaningless. It's worthless. There's no point to it. Verse 10 says, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. So if you're trying to talk to someone, some heretic that's trying to espouse all these false doctrines, false gospel, you don't need to argue with that person. And, and look, the more that you learn from the Bible, the more tempting it might be for you to try to win that argument because you know so much more than they do and you're going to show them that you know more than they do. But really all that is is just an exercise in your flesh than in your spirit. Because God says you're just wasting your time. As a younger Christian, as a younger soul winner, I remember wanting to, do, to get to this point and do this and just because you read and, and you don't have to read much Bible and study much Bible to know more than just about everybody else. It's sad fact because nobody reads their Bibles. And nobody cares enough. And they say, oh, well, if someone says they read it, yeah, it might be like 10 years ago or something they read it, but it's not fresh in mind. They don't really know what it says. Most people don't. So it doesn't take much education or learning uh, of God's Word to be able to have these conversations with people. But some people know a little bit more. And as you really get zealous and you start reading the Bible and you start learning and knowing more and more and more, the temptation is going to come when the Jehovah's False Witness comes to your door right? And they want to they try to teach you that you're going to show them. And you get in this really long debate and it ends up going nowhere. Because they're going to believe what they're going to believe and you obviously believe what you believe and you, you know, you're not going to be fooled by these, by these false gospels. But the Bible says here, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. So if someone, you know, if you're dealing with someone like that and they're real steeped in their religion or whatever, you give them a couple chances. You say, okay, well look, Here's why, here's why salvation is, is eternal life. Here's why it says it's forever. You know, John 5.24 says um, that, that um, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but it is passed from death unto life. And you say, see, look, he says you have everlasting life. He says you shall not come into condemnation. You've already passed from death unto life. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It lasts forever. And they say, oh, no, no, I can't believe that because you've got to do your works. Okay, look, the Bible says, for by grace you are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If they're not willing to hear a couple of scriptures, you give them a first admonition, you give them a second admonition, the Bible says, look, reject them. Move on with your time. You don't need to get wrapped up in vain arguments because it's going to go nowhere. And you'll just end up wasting your time instead of going and talking to someone else maybe a few houses down that's going to be receptive and want to hear the word and actually get saved. Verse 11 says, Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. We learn God's commandments though in order to do them. Turn if you would to James chapter 1. We're going to spend pretty much the rest of the time tonight in James. I know I've got a couple other references in here. I don't know if I'll have you turn to them. But James chapter number 1. Keep on moving to the right. After the book of Hebrews is the book of James. James. 
James chapter 1, look at verse number 21. The Bible says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He's giving them an admonition here. He's a warning. He's saying, look, don't just be a hearer. When you come to church and you hear the word, God's word preached, you say, oh, you, you need to be out there, so you need to be doing this. You need to, be, you need to get this in out of your life. Don't just be a hearer. We need to be doers also. The Bible says, For if any be a hearer of the word, verse 23, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So he says, you know, if you're just a hearer, if you just hear it, you're not a doer, you're going to you know, when you hear God's word, it, it shows you something about yourself, right? It exposes things usually in your life that you need to change. So he's likening this to someone who looks in a mirror. It says, um, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholds himself and goes this way, and then he forgets about it. He forgets what he saw. And when you don't put things into action that you hear out of God's word or that you read from God's word or whatever, um, you're going to forget about it. It's just going to come out of your mind. Just as the Bible warns too about people who, um, it gives the parable of the sower. People can hear God's word preached unto them, preach uh, salvation, you know, about Jesus Christ and how it's eternal life. If that person doesn't choose to put their faith on Jesus Christ shortly after hearing that, what's going to happen is, the devil's going to come and, and, and take the word out of their heart and they're going to forget all about it. They're not going to think about it again. So we go to people's houses and unfortunately the truth of the matter is, the sad truth of the matter is, we can go to people's houses and give them the gospel. And if they don't decide to just put their faith on Jesus Christ right then or shortly thereafter at some point where, where the, the message is still fresh in their mind, they're probably not going to do it at all until maybe someone else brings it up again or they, they hear it again. It's, it's, just, it's just probably not going to not gonna happen. And you know, this is kind of the way, this is great wisdom. You can see, I've seen this in plenty of, of uh, aspects just in my daily life or in my work, at my job. You know, I have a lot of things to do at, at my work. I get a lot of emails. People are always asking me to do different things. And if I don't just like do them right away, like if I, if I get all these emails, you know, I get hundreds of emails. If I don't answer them right away, it just doesn't get done. I just forget all about it. And if I get if other little tasks, people ask me to do something, if I don't do them like real quick or at least set some kind of a reminder or take some kind of action to do it, it just doesn't happen because I just forget about it. Because after a short period of time, it's just gone. And this is the way that it works when you hear God's word also. When you learn some new truth, when you hear something preached and you say, wow, you know, this applies to me. There's something in my life that needs to change. I need to make a difference here. If you don't actually follow through and do something about that, it's not going to happen. You know, I could preach to them right in the face about memorizing the Bible. This is important. You need to do this. You know, the Bible says to hide God's word in your heart and to know it and to meditate on his words and all these other things. I preach an entire sermon on it, but you can hear that and be like, yeah, you know what? That sounds good. I agree with that. The Bible's teaching we ought to be doing this. But if you don't actually do something to make that happen in your life, you're going to go home and then you're going to forget about it. And then next week, two weeks, you're not even going to think about it. It's not even going to cross your mind. Oh, yeah, I should be memorizing the Bible. You're not even going to think about it if you don't do anything about it. And that's just one example. Anything, all the truth that we get out of God's Word, we need to not just be hearers, but doers also and put them into place in our life. The Bible says in verse 25 here, James 1, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. He's saying, look, if you, if you actually put God's words into action, you start doing the work, you're going to be blessed. And you will be blessed. The Bible says, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. 
There's a great call to action right there, visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That's something that we ought to do. That's pure religion. The Bible calls that pure religion. If you want to do, you want to have a pure religion, you want to do what's right, hey, visit the fatherless, visit the widows in their affliction. And keep yourself unspotted from the world. But you can hear it tonight, and if you don't make any actions on, on doing that and implementing this, it's not going to happen. Flip over, if you would, to James chapter 4. Here in chapter 1, just flip over to chapter 4. We're going to look at verse number 10. Verse number 10 reads, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Look at this in verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you become a forgetful hearer and you hear these things, you know this is to do, you know, I know that I need to do good here, but then you don't do it. The Bible says that's a sin. So not only is Doing the wrong thing is sin, right? Doing a bad thing, like committing fornication. That's doing something that's bad. That's not a good thing to do, right? Bowing down to an idol. That's doing a bad thing. It's doing something God has prohibited you from doing. Not only are those sins, but he says, if you know that you should do something good, so you just refrain from doing good. You say, well, I'm just not going to do it. Like in the, in the case of the, uh, the, the Good Samaritan, that story, Right? You've got the, the priest and the Levite. They see this man. He's been beaten up and left for dead and dying in the ditch. Has all these problems. And they just walk over on the other side of the road and they just pass on by him. Right? But then the Samaritan comes along and he helps him. He gets him up. He tries to heal him. He brings him to the inn, you know, and takes care of the guy. And, of course, he was the one that was being a neighbor to him. And the Bible says in the God's all, you know, treat your neighbor as yourself. And, that's, and this was all in the story where the man that confronted Jesus asking him, you know, what must I do in order to, to, to get into the kingdom? And he's telling him all these answers. And um, he goes into that parable explaining, you know, because he said he wanted to justify himself. He's like, well, who is my neighbor? And he gives the whole story explaining that. Look, when you see someone in need like that, you can't just pass right by him. I don't care who you are, if you're a priest or a Levite or you know, someone that supposedly holds these, these high positions, you need to go and help that person. And he says here, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And in the context of James 4 here, what he's explaining is that you know, a lot of people are saying, oh yeah, I'm going to do this in the future. Tomorrow, I'm gonna, I've got these great plans for tomorrow, or next week, and next year. And, he's, and, and they're boasting about this. Like, oh yeah, I'm not doing it right now. But soon, I'm going to do this great work. I'm going, to, I'm going to do all this great work for God. And he's saying, you don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, your life is but a vapor. He's saying, don't boast about the things of the future. You might not even be here for it. Don't be bragging about that, of all of these things that you're going to do. Just start doing them now. And what he says, if you, do, if you are making a plan for that, he says, what you ought to say is, if the Lord will... We'll, we'll live and then do these things. If God allows us, if God wills it, then we will still continue and have these things. You know, it's not wrong to have a plan to do something, but just putting things off and saying, oh yeah, I'm going to do all these great things. A lot of people can talk and where does it end up? You know, a lot of times these, these people just never follow through. They have these great plans and it never follows through because they're not doers. We need to make sure that we are doing. We receive the wisdom. We learn the wisdom from God's word. We learn what he wants us to do, but doesn't stop there. We keep on going. And honestly, I believe this is what truly separates a few Christians from the majority of Christians. 
is being able to do the work. I'm going to read for you from Luke 6. You can stay in, uh, in James. We're going to have one more place we're going to turn to in James, and it's a longer, longer passage, so stay in James. Luke 6.46, I'll read for you. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? There's a lot of people out there that profess Jesus. There's a lot of people, and that's, again, this is real similar to what I was talking about this morning about being a hypocrite, right? When you want to tell someone about Jesus, you know, a lot of people will claim the name of Jesus, but then when you look at their life, you're like, wait, you mean you, you follow Jesus? Like, doesn't really make much sense because we're living a hypocritical life. He says, Jesus himself was saying, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You're calling me Lord, but you're not even doing it, right? He's saying, you're calling me and Lord is just what? Like your boss, right? You're the, the, the Lord and the servant. Why are you calling me your Lord and you're not even doing the things that I say? You're not listening to me. Verse 47 says, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So when you hear Jesus' sayings and do them, you're going to have that wisdom and be able to build great things and do great things. And he's talking here about building a great house, right? Well, when you listen to what he's saying and then follow through and actually do them, you got a great foundation. It's God's word. It's a rock. It's solid. And whatever you build on there is going to last because you're, you're, you're using the wisdom of God. But if you hear and you don't do the things that he says, oh yeah, I heard that, but I'm going to go and do things my own way, and you just go and just start building things the way that you think it ought to be done, he says that house is going to fall, and it's going to be a great disaster, because you're not heeding what he's saying and doing the things that he's told you to do. Now, if you're saved, the instructions for your life in the Bible are pretty straightforward. Obviously, first, you have to read and know what those instructions are from his word. Then you have to do them. And doing them is a lot harder than knowing. It's a lot easier to, to sit at home and read the Bible and say, oh, yeah, God doesn't want me to do this. He wants me to do this. And, and to get that understanding in your head. But it's a lot harder putting them into practice. Right? We were talking about this before service with the Bible memorization, right? We know it's something that we should do. But putting it into practice it tends to be a lot harder. But we need to be able to find a way to push ourselves in order to get these things done because we know that it's something that we need to be doing. And we need to, to make these changes and actually put them into action. We, it, you know, God's Word is life-changing. This is a life-changing book. Not only does He give you a new life through salvation, He gives you all of the ways uh, in, in which to live a life that is going to be um, completely fulfilling that is going to bring you joy. I'm not going to, you know, it's not necessarily going to make you rich, but riches don't buy you happiness anyways. God's word, when you follow what's right, when you can lay your head down at night and just know you've just done good, you've done good things, it's a good feeling. I mean, there's plenty of times in my past where, I, where I've done terrible things. And it's just a bad feeling. You, you, you know, you, you're ashamed of yourself, you know, things you might have done. I don't, I don't want to live my life like that. Just always being down because of the things I do, just they're not helping anybody. They're not doing any good. It's all vain. It's all worthless. Even if you're not out doing specifically like bad things to people, if you just dedicate your whole life to things that are ultimately going to be meaningless because this world's just going to be destroyed. I mean, if I just, just spent my entire life just trying to, to make a lot of money, you know, I might not be hurting anybody, and do anything that evil, but it's just, it's just worthless. It's all just going to be gone away, gone away anyway. It's going to be burned up. And what did I do with my life? I wasted it. 
as opposed to following God's will and what he has planned for all of us to do, to be ministers unto others and to help other people out, to go out and continually try to reach and to seek and to save that which is lost and go out and bring the gospel and the good news of, of God and Jesus to people that are hurting in this world, that have been deceived by the devil, been deceived by sin, deceived by these other lies that are ruining their life where you can actually help them with the truth and with wisdom. But we need to not only learn that wisdom for ourselves, but put it into action. Doing is a lot harder than knowing. And, and the reason why I make that statement where I think that applies to, to most Christians is because of, a, of something that Jesus Christ said. A lot of people will claim that they follow Jesus. Oh yeah, I follow Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus, you know, all this and that, and, and they'll just keep on naming the name of Jesus. But the reason why most Christians are not doing what Jesus said is because Jesus Christ himself said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. A lot of people claim to be following Jesus, but they're not fishers of men. They're not going out and bringing other people to Christ. I mean, think about fishermen. What do they do? They cast their line, they catch a fish, and they bring it in, right? Well, Jesus said, and he was talking to his apostles, or he said to, to Peter and um, James and John, they were all fishermen. He said, well, look, if you follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. You'll go out and catch men and bring them to me. And not just fish. But Jesus, is, his words here, his command, he said, you follow me, and I will make you a fisherman. So when you follow Jesus, he turns you into someone who's going to make you a fisher of men. So if you claim that you follow Jesus, but you're not a fisher of men, are you really following Jesus? I would say no. To truly follow Jesus means that he's making you and turning you into a fisher of men. And again... As a, you know, as, as a baby in Christ, whatever, you're, you're going to need to learn more. But I think being a fisher of men can happen immediately. There's the story of the woman at the well. If you remember that story, Jesus Christ was sitting at a well. His disciples had gone off. He was there by himself. And this woman came, a Samaritan woman came to draw water out of the well. And, you know, he basically says, hey, give me some water. And um, they have this conversation, right? And, and he explains to her, he says, well, you know, if you knew who you're talking to, you'd ask me and I'd give you living waters. Basically, I'd give you water where you'd never thirst. And he's, he's talking to her about salvation, about having eternal life. So, at some point she understands that, that he's the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. That he's the Messiah and believes on him. And the first thing she does is she leaves her water pots there and goes off and starts telling other people and saying, hey, look at this guy. Isn't this the Christ? And she's trying to get people to follow her and to come to Jesus Christ. The very first thing that she does after she receives the words of Christ, believes what he's saying to be true, she goes and tells other people and points them to Christ. Say, here's, here's the Christ. Look, he's told me everything that I ever, ever I did. Isn't this the Christ? And she brings people to him. It's the first thing that she did. You don't have to be saved forever to be, to be doing this, to be a fisher of men. And it's something that God wants all of us to do. Um, that is the ultimate calling for everybody. I'm not saying it's the only thing that God wants you to do, but it, it is the primary, it is the most important thing. Now, We don't want to turn into this type of person either that, I, that I've had plenty of contact with. The, the people that will tell you that they know Christ, they've read the Bible. I've had people tell me, I know everything that the Bible says. And I always chuckle within myself, you know, because we go out knocking doors. And, and I, you know, when we, when we try to preach the gospel, we're not there to be rude and to start fights and, 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 to, and to call people out when they say stupid things like that. But it, it always kind of boggles my mind when someone says, I know everything that the Bible says. It's like, you're not even saved. You don't, you don't even know what it says about salvation. Because they'll ask him, okay, well, how do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And they'll just say, basically, that they're a good person and they do good things. You just told me you know everything the Bible says. Apparently, you don't. 
right? And, uh, and you know, it, it's, it, I can speak with a little bit more of an attitude here in church because, uh, you know, I'm illustrating a point. We don't, I don't do that at the door. You know, I don't just, just call them out and make them feel stupid. Because when you do that, you're just going to you're going to make them angry, and they're not going to want to listen to you at all, right? The point there, when you talk to the person, is just to just to get them to open up and think about what the Bible actually says. But we don't want to turn into that type of a person who just says, you know, I know, I know, I've read the whole Bible, I know everything it says, and you can't be taught anything because you know it all. You don't want to be this know it all. No one can tell you any different. I've talked to one guy where, you know, he doesn't go to church anywhere. He said, I've been to all the churches in here and I don't go to any of them because their pastors don't know anything. That's a pretty bold statement. You know, I don't, I don't know all the pastors in town, but I'm not going to say that all the pastors in town don't know anything. That's a pretty arrogant statement to make. Not just bold, it's pretty arrogant. It's pretty full of yourself to say, well, I know so much more than all these other people. And the reason why he thought that is because he had all kinds of weird, strange doctrines that like almost nobody believes. Literally. And it's, it, you know, yeah, well, no one, no one believes like you because you're wrong. And like just nobody believes that. I mean, weird things about, you know, I'm not even going to get into it. I'm not even going to defile your mind with some of the weird things that, that this guy believed. I tried to have a discussion with him for a little while, but we don't want to get to that point. But it's funny how these people who know everything and can't be taught anything, how they're never fishers of men. They're never going out and getting converts to Christ. Never. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8.1, you don't have to turn there. Say, turn, if you would, to James chapter 2. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. He said, if you think you're so smart and you know it all, you don't know anything yet. But in, in that verse number one, it says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Charity is not just giving money to people. That's kind of the way we commonly think of the word charity, is giving money to an organization to help people out. Charity is a lot more than that. Charity is just is basically love where you are taking action on, on other people and doing things for other people just in general. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's, it's all about the charity and how important it is to have charity. So what the Bible says here, knowledge puffeth up. Just by learning and increasing your knowledge and wisdom, it can kind of give you a sense of, of arrogancy and pride. But you balance that out. You balance all that studying out by having charity, which means you're acting on it and doing things for other people. That will help make you more humble because you're interacting with people and trying to use what you've learned to help them. So you're not just thinking about yourself. The more you learn, if you don't help anyone else, if you just mass all this knowledge to yourself and you gain all this wisdom and this knowledge, you're going to think now that you're better than other people because you know so much. All of a sudden, you can look at people and say, well, they're all just stupid. I've heard clips of a pastor saying that, or an evangelist saying that before, that the people in the, in the pews are stupid. What kind of a man thinks about people that way? Like, oh yeah, you're just all dumb. I don't think about you guys that way. But see, what he does is he doesn't go out and, and use charity to edify people. He just studies and studies and studies and thinks he's so smart and smarter than everybody else. Increasing your knowledge without having the charity and going out and doing things will do that to you. You'll start to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But when you can use that to, to help other people out, because when you help other people out, when you esteem other people better than yourself, that is the key to making sure you keep yourself humble. That, that you are not being lifted up with pride because you're recognizing this person's important, that person, I need to do something to help them. When you have that type of an attitude, it's really hard for you to get lifted up in yourself because you're focused on other people. You're not focused on yourself and how much you know. You're focused on what can I do to help them. And that's the attitude we need to have as we go through this journey and, and as we learn more things. Make sure that we keep putting it into use and not just be a hearer. James chapter 2. We're going to close on this. It's a great chapter. I love every word of the Bible. I love every book of the Bible. This is a chapter that, that throws Christians for a loop sometimes. They don't understand what it means. 
<laughs> because a lot of false religions will use this chapter and try to point to these scriptures as, as, as evidence that it teaches a works-based salvation. But it doesn't. And I'm gonna, we're going to go through this a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly explain what this is talking about and how we need to apply it for ourselves. Because it goes exactly with what I'm talking about tonight is what it means. But let's, let's, let's read through this. I'm not going to read all of it, but let's start in verse 14 of James chapter 2. Because this is, this is a key phrase right here. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now there's two phrases just at the beginning of this passage here that we're reading, or this section of Scripture that, that we're looking at. First he says, what doth it profit? So what is the benefit? What is it good for? Though a man say he hath faith. Now it doesn't say he has faith, it just says he says he has faith. Right? Now isn't there a lot of people that can say, first of all, that could say they have faith, that really don't, that can claim the name of Jesus, but they really don't believe on him because they're trusting in themselves? A lot of people can say all kinds of things and have not works. It says, and it says, what is a prophet? So what is it good for? What is it good for if a man says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? And I would agree with that. What, what is that good for? What good are you doing to anybody? Who is that helping if you say you have faith, but you're not doing anything for God? You're not doing any good works? He says, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? He's saying, what good is it? Again, it's the same phrase. What is it good for? If someone comes to you and they say, hey, I'm cold. I'm hungry. Can you help me out? And you say, oh, yeah, yeah. Go your way. Be, be warm. God bless you. I hope you get a lot of food. What good does that do for that person? What does that profit them? Nothing. This is a point he's trying to make. Let's just get this right ahead. We're reading this, right? In order to help someone who needs clothing and food, you need to give them clothing and food. I mean, that's what they're lacking. You need to help them out. That's going to benefit those people with their needs. You're going to help them out. That will actually do something. So he says here, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. True scripture. You have faith in Christ. If you're not doing anything, if you have no works for your God, if, you, if you're not doing anything, your faith dies. Now look at, notice what it doesn't say there, first of all. It doesn't say, and you're going to lose your salvation and the everlasting life is no longer everlasting. It does not say that. It doesn't say you're going to hell. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It just says that your faith is dying. Okay? It has nothing to do with the moment you received eternal life that all of a sudden that's null and void, doesn't say that. People will try to twist it and make you think that's what it's saying, but that's not what it says. It says here that if you don't have any works, your faith is going to die. And that's a true statement. If I don't put food and water into my body, my body is going to die. It's a fact, right? Faith, your, your faith will die when you don't do the good works. You're not exercising, you're not doing anything with it. Your faith is going to die. But it doesn't mean your salvation is gone. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. It's an interesting uh, uh, sentence there, but how can you show somebody what you believe in if you don't do any works? How can you show that to someone? You can't. It's impossible. You can't show someone else what you believe without actually doing something. Right? And he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. And this is the way that we ought to live. Hey, we ought to be able to show people our faith by doing good works. It doesn't mean we're trusting in our works. But if we have a lively faith, we're going to be doing things. We're going to be acting on that faith. We're going to be acting on that belief. And this is the, the one point in my life where I got really down and out. I mentioned this this morning briefly, but um, there was a point where I questioned my own salvation. Where I wasn't quite there. And, and I think a lot of people go through this. But for me, it was 
Because I knew I was saved. I knew I was saved. I knew I put my faith in Jesus. It was only through Him. I get ever everlasting life. But after years of just doing what I want to do, and drinking, and partying, and doing drugs, and doing these types of things, I got to a point where I asked myself, how can I even tell myself that I believe the Bible, that I believe God's Word, if I'm doing all these things that I know are wrong? My faith was dead. I wasn't doing anything for God. But I didn't lose my salvation. I still had eternal life just as much as I had it the day I put my faith in Jesus Christ, the same as I have it right now, the same as I'm going to have it for eternity. It's eternal life. But the faith died, and then that's where you're going to start to doubt and, and cause all kinds of problems in your life because you're not doing any works. He says here, um, and I couldn't show anybody, but no one, no one that looked at me would say, oh yeah, there's a Christian man because my works did not show it at all. My works was just some, your average guy that doesn't believe that's out in the world, that's doing things that people do. But they wouldn't say, oh yeah, there's a Christian. Not for a second. Verse 19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And don't let anyone ever take this verse and try to spin it around on you. Say, see, the devils believe, but they're not saved. Trying to tell you that believing isn't enough. Now, does this say, thou believest on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation? No, it says, thou believest that there is one God. Is believing that there's one God, does that make you saved? Just believing that there is only one God. Being a monotheist. Does that all of a sudden just make you saved? No. The Muslims believe that there's one God. Allah, right? One God. They believe in one. They're a monotheistic religion. Are they just all saved because they believe there's one God? No. Now the Bible says you do well that you believe there's one God because it's true there is one God. You believe there's one God? Yes, that's true. You're doing good. You're on the right path. You believe there's one God. But that's not what gets you saved. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is what gets you saved. But here it says the devils also believe in trouble. Yeah, they believe there's one God also. It doesn't say they're putting their faith in Jesus Christ to save them. Two different things. Let's keep reading here, verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Again, a rephrase of what we already read. Hey, faith without works is dead. Yes, we know that. That's a true statement. Again, I'm not going to deny that because it's written plain and clear in the Bible. But I do not take the extra leap of saying that this just means you're no longer saved. No, it just means that your faith has died. You need to revive it. You need to start doing some works again to, to revive your faith in the Lord. Verse 21. Now he's going to go through some examples of people in the Old Testament. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? Abraham had faith that God was going to raise his son up from the dead when he was told to offer him on the altar. I went through this in the Genesis series when we were going through the whole book of Genesis and during this chapter when, he, when God told him to bring your son, his only son, right? Uh, the, the, the son of promise in his old age. He said, bring your son up and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Abraham had already believed, believed the promises of God. But he didn't deny God at this point. He just says, okay, I'm going to go through with it. Why? Because he believed that God was able to raise him again from the dead. And these actions, it says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. He's showing his faith by his carrying out what God told him to do. And, and knowing he already had the faith that God was capable of raising him from the dead. He already had that faith, the saving faith. But now he's showing him, yeah, I'm going to follow through this because I believe it, because this is what I believe. I'm going to do whatever God tells me to do, because I know that even if I were to, to enact here the, the, the sacrifice of my son, which was a picture of Jesus Christ to come, even if I do this, I know God's able to raise him back from the dead again anyways. That's why he told his servants that the lad and I are coming back. He says, we're going to go up there to offer, and then we're coming back. And he mentioned both of them are coming back, even though he already knew he was going up there to, to, that God wanted him to sacrifice his son. He already had total faith that God was going to do it from the beginning. 
But acting it out, God stopped him before he actually did it. He said, oh, okay, see, your actions are proving his faith. Verse number uh, 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Now again, it doesn't say you see that a man is only justif you know, is justified by faith and works. It says that, that how by works a man is justified. There is a way to be justified by works. Not just through your faith. There's a way to be justified. Justified how, though? Justified in the eyes of God or justified in the eyes of man? All of these things, it started off, remember, talking about people who come to you, they're naked, they're hungry, they need stuff. It doesn't do them any good just to say something to them, just to say that they could be filled. You actually have to do something for them. It's for the benefit of other men, for other people to see Right? The benefit is always for somebody else. So, how are we justified by our works? In the eyes of other people. That's how we're justified by our works and not by our faith only. Our faith, we're justified in the eyes of God. And you could, you could compare this with Romans chapter 4, which, which says the exact same thing on the, on the other end of the spectrum. Romans chapter 4 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of to glory, but not before God. Abraham can glory or boast about his works before other people, before men. But not before God, because that's not what makes a person righteous before God. Before God, what makes you righteous is your faith in Jesus Christ that he paid for your sins. But other people can't see your faith. Like, we give this example all the time, I'll tell you, you can't see my heart in what I believe. You can't see it. You don't know what is in my heart and what my belief actually is. So the only way you can judge another person and their beliefs is by the things that they say and the things that they do. If I tell you I think it's wrong to drink alcohol, I think it's wrong to go to the movies, I think it's wrong to fornicate, I think it's wrong to do whatever, and it's sort of going down all these sins, I think these are all wrong, and then you watch me, I'm just doing all these things, and I'm telling you that, that oh, I believe it's wrong. My actions are going to show you that you don't really believe that. Now, maybe I do. Maybe I'm just extremely weak in my flesh. But I really do believe those things, and, I, and my faith is in Christ. You won't see that, because all you're going to see is, is what I'm doing. And you're going to make a judgment, which wouldn't necessarily be a bad judgment, that, that you, you know, I don't see how this guy could be a Christian, because he's doing all these things. But you don't know that for sure. But see, God knows. God can see our heart. The way that we're justified and what this is talking about here, you see then how that by works a man is justified not by faith only. That how, how are we justified by works? We are justified by works in the eyes of other people. When they can see the things that we do with our life. And they can see that we truly do believe these things. This is what this whole section of Scripture in James chapter 2 is talking about. A lot of people have a hard time with it, like I said, because there's the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and many other people, many other denominations, but those specifically will tell you that, oh, no, 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 see, look, you have to have works. It's not just by faith, it's faith and works. I mean, if you, if you have faith and no works, your faith is dead, and they'll say that you're not saved. Then why does the Bible say, there would be, if that were true, there'd be a contradiction. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's talking about being saved, it's talking about getting the gift of God, and it's talking about it being not of works. Very clearly talking about our salvation. This is not that clear talking about our salvation. We, we read a lot of stuff here saying, um... It's all about being justified before other people. That's why it doesn't seem so clear-cut on salvation. It doesn't mention eternal life anywhere in this passage. It doesn't say you're not going to have everlasting life, or you're going to go to hell, or you're going to go to heaven, or anything like that. It doesn't mention any of those things because it's not talking about your salvation. It's talking about how you're justified in the eyes of other men. 
But what do we take away from this? To wrap it all the way back around again. We're learning a lot of things from the Bible. We should be. We should be studying and gaining knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom's a principal thing. Make sure you're in your Bible. You're getting that knowledge. But don't let your faith die because you're not doing anything with it. Because you're just a hearer and not a doer. By being a hearer and not a doer, your faith is going to die. And it's just going to lead you down the wrong path. We need to be continually, as we learn things, put them in place in our life, put them in place, keep doing them and doing them and increasing more and more. Take action. Take some time to determine what you really believe. Read the Bible. What do I believe? And what do you believe is actually important for you to do? What is, what is the Bible saying that is really important that I need to be doing according to the Bible? What do you believe you should be doing? Ask yourself that question. What do you think you should be doing according to what God's Word says? Once you identify that, ask yourself, am I doing this? Is this something that I actively do or not? And if it's not, you better make it something that you do do. If you're believing this, make it an action. Go out and prove your faith to others. Have a lively faith. Do the things you believe is God's will and don't do the things that you think aren't His will. It's a simple message tonight. It's not, it's not real complicated. It's not some deep thing. But we need to hear this from time. We need to take the things that we learn and put them into action so that we can have a lively faith. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we get through your word, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us all not to just leave tonight as a hearer, but not a doer. Help us not to just walk away and say, oh yeah, I agree with that. That was a great sermon. Uh, uh, I, I liked all those scriptures that we read, but then do nothing and within a couple weeks just forget all about it completely. Lord, I pray that you please help us not to be like that, but that we can identify the areas in our life that we need to work on, things that we believe in, that we could ask ourselves, do I believe this? Yes, but if we're not doing anything about it, Lord, help us to make those changes that we can do these things and that we can be um, doers of the word, not just hearers only, that we could be workmen that, that are not ashamed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.